we're doing. Our fighters today are speedier than ever before. We're designing even faster planes. Some of our new bombers can strike at almost any place in the world. Here's your chance to see all these planes in action. Bring the family to your nearest Air Force base tomorrow. It's open house and you're all invited. What do you say, hmm? That's the way it happened. My son just looked at me expectantly as if to say, well, Pop, my wife gave me the nod. So what could a guy do? Okay, we'll go. Your attention, please. Welcome to Open House at your Air Force Base. We're glad you're here so you can know your Air Force better. exciting, even for me. The only trouble was, little Jimmy expected me to know a lot of things I didn't know. When I looked over one of the planes and saw my family watching me, waiting for words of wisdom, I knew I was a dead duck. Know your Air Force better, the man said. I don't know the Air Force at all. Where does the guy start? He starts right where you do, Private Citizen USA, by wanting to know your Air Force better. Take fighters, for example. That plane you're wondering about is the F-47, better known as the Thunderbolt. It's a fast and rugged fighter, one of the heroes of World War II. F-47, now taxiing for takeoff. There's another good fighter, proven in World War II. But the post-war years have brought new designs. Planes that fly farther and faster. For speed, the hottest thing with props are outclassed by the new jet fighters. They fly faster than 600 miles an hour. The Shooting Star is the first of our post-war jet fighters and the F-86, fastest Air Force fighter. The Thunder Jet is another of our rapidly developing line of jet-propelled fighters. As for the F-89, it's the first four-jet long-range fighter, effective night or day, in all kinds of weather. It has a pressurized cabin and a range of more than 1,500 miles. Still another jet fighter, the little experimental F-85, is called a parasite plane because it's designed to be carried aloft by long-range bombers. It's released when necessary to fight off enemy planes. And baby comes back to mother when the fighting's all over. Your attention, please. The bombers now landing are B-29, the famous super force. The B-29s help break the back of Japanese resistance with long-range bombing raids. One of them carried the first atom bomb to Hiroshima. And here comes the B-36, the biggest land-based bomber in the world. Yes, sir, that's the truth. This air giant has a far greater range than any other bomber. That's why the Air Force calls it an intercontinental bomber. In tests, one B-36 took aloft and dropped successfully two 42,000-pound bombs. We also have jet-powered bombers, the B-45, powered by four jet engines, with a 1,600-mile fighting range at better than 500 miles per hour. And then there's the big Stratojet with six jet engines, it's in the 600-mile-an-hour class, 
with a range of 2,000 miles. And this radical design, XB-49, an eight-jet propelled flying wing. An F-80 buzzing the field. We stood there watching the jets go by. That is, we tried to watch them. Little Jimmy was certainly getting all the excitement he bargained for. As a matter of fact, so was I. Our Air Force is great stuff. A thrill every minute. Easy now. The Air Force isn't all thrills, you know. Take MATS, for example. That's Military Air Transport Service. MATS, for short. A combination of the old Army, Air Force, and Navy Air Transport Commands. Covering more than 80,000 miles of air lanes all over the world. MATS is streamlined to expedite the air transport of military personnel and cargo. Materials carried come in every size and shape, requiring trained ground crews to help speed military supplies to destinations everywhere. It's planes like these which are used for all types of emergency service. MATS also uses large transports like the Navy's Constitution, one of the biggest aircraft of post-war years. Another large transport is the C-97 Stratocruiser. This giant goes 4,000 miles nonstop, carrying a payload of 20 tons, or 137 fully equipped combat troops. fun too. We all got a laugh out of Mickey the midget run by remote control. That means the operator just jiggled a little lever to put Mickey through his paces. Mickey was a ground demonstration to show people like me how big planes are remotely controlled. The forward B-17 has no operating crew aboard. Its flight is radio controlled by the mothership in the rear. I'll bet you recognize B-17s. They were good airplanes, did a big job during the war. Today we use them for experimental work of all kinds. Down in Florida, these pilotless planes are used to make test emergency landings in water. Ditching is the Air Force term. By using a radio-controlled ship, shown here in slow motion, engineers can measure the effects of ditching on structures without risking the lives of flight crews. But when lives are actually endangered, well, that's a different story. Attention, please. You will now witness an air-sea rescue demonstration. The B-29 approaching the field is carrying a paralyte boat. In an air-sea rescue mission, the boat is dropped by the rescue plane. The parachute will land it in the water right side up. The boat is equipped with an engine, maps and charts, food, medical supplies, and radio. Sometimes the Air Rescue Service base sends its flying windmills out to give stranded flyers an honest-to-goodness airlift to safety. Besides their use in rescue work, helicopters have many functions. This is a model of a helicopter of the future, the XH-16. It's a cargo craft with detachable compartments designed to carry troops and heavy equipment to regions inaccessible to standard planes. The XH-10 is the first twin-engine transport-type helicopter. It carries 10 persons. I was having fun, even though I felt a little ashamed of my low Air Force IQ. Then little Jimmy tugged at me, and he pointed out something different. I brightened up. This I knew. It was a guided missile. I remembered the stories I'd read about guided missiles, and the exciting newsreels I'd seen showing experiments with them.
also remembered seeing a film showing JB-2 rocket experiments at the Air Force Proving Ground Command in Florida. After a guided missile is launched, a jet fighter plane is assigned to shoot it down. Yes, you remember your newsreels, Private Citizen USA. And after this day's visit, you'll know and roar about your Air Force. And with your knowledge, and that of your fellow citizens, will come the full public understanding and support the Air Force needs to carry out its mission. A few yesterdays ago, this little airplane flew faster than sound. And this big bomber completed the first nonstop flight around the world. A few tomorrows from today, your Air Force will still be moving forward, helping in emergencies, while continuing its daily round-the-clock service to you and your family. The Air Force has a big mission, and an important one. It involves the future well-being of every American, the peace of all the world. capital today are the military men whose job is to make the United States secure against attack. Men who are responsible for anticipating where and what form war might strike again. For well, the purpose of this particular problem and strategy, let's assume that the United States is being attacked from the north and from the northwest by massive air forces. The only warning we could expect would be what we would normally get from our present radar facilities. In the first wave, attacking would be bombers escorted by Convinced that the first and perhaps decisive move in any future war may well be a surprise attack from the air, the American people have elected to make air power the nation's first line of defense. Year by year, this new Air Force, no longer a part of the Army, has grown from its post-war skeleton strength to an armada many times as great. But the 70-group force of completely modern planes, which airmen and Congress once agreed was the minimum necessary for national security, has been slow indeed of achievement. Vigorously pushing ahead with the task of building up an air fleet to defend the United States against attack and to strike back decisively against an aggressor is the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force, General Hoyt S. Vandenberg. For the nation's top airmen are well aware that we can count on only a short term of security before other nations are producing atomic weapons in formidable quantity. Constantly adding to American uneasiness is the post-war political atmosphere. In the United Nations, the U.S. representatives have long been using the enormous power and prestige of their country to secure the peace of the world against the only rival power strong enough to dare overthrow it. But Russia, letting the world know that it already possesses the atom bomb, has continued its provocations. An urgent necessity in rebuilding the U.S. Air Force was to revive the aircraft industry, whose output had diminished alarmingly in the first years after the war. By carefully allocating the funds allowed it by Congress, the Air Force was able to distribute initial orders for 2,000 new planes among certain key manufacturers. One of the most famous of the post-war models has been the giant B-36 which was only being delivered three years after the war, though it had been designed in 1942. 
For between the time any given plane emerges from the design stage and the time it is ready for delivery, airmen must count on a lapse of several years. Largest of land-based bombers, the B-36 can carry 10,000 pounds of bombs for 10,000 miles, and its enormous tanks can swallow up some 21,000 gallons of gasoline, as much as two railroad tank cars can carry. Even the famed B-29 was relegated to the role of medium bomber by the huge B-36. Setting out to restore its curtailed manpower in the post-war years, the Air Force had soon achieved a strength of some 400,000 men, pilots, ground crews, technicians, and all the various kinds of specialists required to fly and service an air armada which, though still short of the designated 70 groups, had grown enormously. Schooling in the Air Force is an endless process, not only for enlisted men, but for officers as well. The new Air University, made up of a number of advanced schools, gives senior officers concentrated courses which include such subjects as command and staff work, air strategy, and air tactics. Officers selected for the Air University are veterans who held responsible posts during the war, but whose combat activities gave them little chance to become familiar with the broader application of air power. Here they get the special education which prepares them to assume larger responsibilities. Part of their training involves learning to work with the Navy, despite old rivalries which still exist between the Air Force and the Naval Air Arm, for the Navy has almost as many planes as the Air Force itself. The work of building up the new Air Force and manning air bases distributed throughout the country and overseas, a key figure is the man who commands the combat group, for he and his group, many times multiplied, are the Air Force. One of these is Lieutenant Colonel David Schilling. Dave Schilling came out of the war with plenty of honors and citations like all other combat flyers and was assigned to command his old wartime fighter group, the 56th, at Selfridge Field near Detroit. His superior officer is Wing Commander William T. Hudnell, who ran up an impressive record of his own in the war. As Wing Commander, Colonel Hudnell is in charge of the whole base where Schilling and his group are stationed. While Schilling handles air operations, Colonel Hudnell commands the complex establishment it takes to keep combat groups flying, including the hangars and machine shops where planes are torn down and overhauled between flights. The jet fighters the Air Force is using these days have to be overhauled more often than the old propeller type because of the enormous speed of the turbines and the heat of the engines. The continuing developments in jets call for a lot more technical knowledge on the part of the ground crews, the boys who have to service the planes and keep them in shape. Knowing what the weather is like all over the country is important to jet flyers. They cover 600 miles an hour, flying seven or eight miles up. They have to be sure of just what conditions they're going to meet at the end of a cross-country trip. housekeeping and service facilities are taken care of for him, Dave Schilling still finds plenty of paperwork to tie him down at the office when he'd a lot rather be out flying. To keep the job of administration in hand, he relies on his staff, every man on it young like himself and like himself a veteran. But the thing he's really there for is to turn the pilots in his group 
into a beautifully coordinated, smoothly functioning combat team. This means his men have to chalk up plenty of hours on the squadron scoreboard in each one of a dozen different kinds of flight training. The flying performance of the individual pilot is what largely determines how each group stacks up as a fighting unit. When the pilots of the 56th fighter group are accumulating air hours, Dave Schilling is apt to be out on the runway. He likes to keep an eye on them, particularly on the youngsters newly assigned to the group who are just beginning to get the hang of combat tactics in hot planes like the Lockheed F-80 that Schilling's group flies. Uh, hello, Tower. This is uh, number 5 on landing. American 4 Roger, 5-1. Check your diet flaps down, your gear down. Green light on, I-16 on, hydraulic pressure up, flaps as desired, you're clear in number one. Well, it looks like the young sports are going to be okay. At the officers' club, where all the pilots meet at the end of the working day, everybody talks one thing, shop. But where are the propellers? <laughs> the club is a secondary classroom where new boys can pick up a lot of angles. Young pilots of today have to be adaptable and quick to learn. If they are to keep up with the new planes, they'll soon be called upon to fly. The North American F-86 is one of the world's fastest jet fighters. The Northrop F-89, an experimental plane, is a fast night fighter, bulging with radar and electronic equipment. The Boeing B-47, a jet bomber with swept back wings, is one of the fastest which has ever taken to the air. The Northrop Flying Wing is a large jet bomber, uniquely American in design. McDonald's grotesque looking XF-85 was planned as a parasite plane. designed to be carried in and launched from its mother ship, a big bomber, to provide fighter protection deep inside enemy territory. Having no landing gear, the fighter returns to its mother ship after its mission is completed. At Wright Field, at the headquarters of the Air Materiel Command, Aeronautical engineers work on problems of research and development. By studying the behavior of model planes in the vertical wind tunnel, they discover how pilots can pull out of dangerous spins or bail out safely from fast jets. By other tests, engineers can find out the structural weaknesses of any given plane. In aviation medicine, intensive research is directed toward making life easier, longer, and safer for pilots. Tests made on startling machines like the Wright Field centrifuge indicate that future rocket planes flying well over a thousand miles an hour may be piloted from a prone position. Thus, airmen will be better able to withstand the terrific pull of gravity in tight turns. Laboratories are not the only places where airmen are being tested for the future. 
In the 56th and every other Air Force group, pilots and planes are always being tried out on long operational flights. Dave Schilling and his men have flown to Alaska and every corner of the United States. And they were the first American jet group ever to fly the Atlantic. With the weather we have today, extending over the eastern portion of the United States, we should make Goose Bay for tonight. Are there any questions? Okay, be in our cockpits. At 1440, takeoff will be 1455 hours. Let's go. Today, the men who fly in Dave Schilling's outfit and thousands more like them in fighter groups and bomber groups all over the country have learned to accept as a matter of routine flying assignments that would have been special stunts for the most experienced pilots only a couple of years back. Selfridge Tower to Catfish, you're cleared for takeoff when ready. Today, the aim of the U.S. Air Force is to become a weapon so formidable that no potential enemy will dare risk its counter blows. For its commanding officers believe that America's air power by making war too costly for an aggressor, may turn out to be the strongest guarantee both of the nation's security and of the world's peace.